All right, so we're starting. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the Electrochemical Colloquium. Today we're discussing ion transport and defect chemistry within the framework of solid state electrochemistry. So as many of you know, uh, the kinetics of charge transfer processes is central to the operation of materials that rely on both ion and electron transport. And those materials, for example, are battery materials, supercapacitors, photovoltaic materials, and, and many, many others. So this fundamental understanding of charge transfer kinetics in solids in, is absolutely paramount if we work in the field of electrochemistry. Our today's speaker is Professor Joachim Meyer, who's the leading expert in the solid state physical chemistry, electrochemistry, and chemical kinetics. So Joachim received his PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research and did his habilitation at the University of Tübingen. And since 1991, he's been the director at the Max Planck Institute and a professor at the University of Stuttgart. So Joachim, thank you so much for joining us today. Now the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Maybe I correct you, I did my primary education in Saarbrücken, where I got my, my, my degree in Saarbrücken. Um, yeah, so solid state electrochemistry is indeed an important point, as you mentioned. And maybe I start um, simply by a citation from Kortum's classic book on electrochemistry, saying uh, electrochemistry is equally disliked by chemists as it is by physicists. And I would like to add, solid state electrochemistry is even disliked by the electrochemists because a lot of solid state knowledge has also to be in. So let me do a screen sharing here. Now, this is a typical device situation of uh, solid state electrochemistry. In the middle, you see an oxygen ion conductor uh, that may be a ceramic zirconium dioxide. Um, this is a solid situation, a solid material, and this allows at high temperatures to convert hydrogen with oxygen to water. Um, then we also, in addition of the electrolyte, we have solid electrodes, they're also solid, but they are not necessarily only ion conductors, they are typically ion plus electronic conductors. And then you have a variety of other materials like leads that are electronically conducting. So you see, it's a major goal to play around with charge carriers um, in, in solid state. Let me just find a pointer here. So I uh, would like to Add another citation, namely by a physicist colleague who once said, so what is electrochemistry good for if not for things like batteries and fuel cells? And so then I responded to him, do you realize that in the very moment that you are saying this, there are zillions of electrochemical processes in your brain that enable you just to formulate this question. So electrochemistry is everywhere at least everywhere when uh, one is uh, dealing with conversion of chemical energy or information into electrical energy and information. So these are the two best uh, understood, at least materials of our world, I would say. This is the water of the chemists and is a silicon of the physicists. So on the left-hand side, it's not so much uh, the importance that one understands the water structure. It's rather important to identify the relevant particles. These are dissociated particles, H plus and OH minus ions. And on the, the other side, on the silicon side, not so much important to understand the structure, rather to identify electrons and holes as a decisive carriers. And uh, in the same way, whenever dealing with uh, functional materials, um, one has to identify the charge carriers and you have to understand their concentrations and their interactions. So since you asked me to be fundamental, so let me in a nutshell summarize some thermodynamic and kinetic issues that are of importance. So we are looking at a, a conversion of a species A to another one A dash, while simultaneously the position may be changed. Now the 
relevant potential is Gibbs energy. As you know, it depends on pressure, temperature, and the array of different mole numbers. That's why I took simply a vector here. But this variation has to be zero. Uh, and then one can find out the equilibrium situation uh, as a function of pressure, temperature, and the mole numbers. So the variation of pressure is characterized by the volume, the so variation with temperature by the entropy, and the variation in terms of mole number is characterized by the chemical potentials. So the latter point means that essentially in equilibrium, we deal with a balance of chemical potentials or if charged of electrochemical potential. So if X is equal to X dash, meaning uh, we just have a homogeneous chemical reaction, then we end up with mass action loss, as you all know. So the balance of the chemical potentials. And if <clears throat> A is equal to A dash, and we just change the positional co coordinate, then this describes the hopping process within a crystal. And this means then, then in equilibrium, the electrochemical potentials should not have any gradient. Now, if <clears throat> G deviates from the equilibrium value, then we create we, 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 uh, create rates, we generate rates, uh, for example, reaction rate or diffusion flux in these two cases considered. So if we are looking at the situation close to equilibrium, then the rate can be, can be written in terms of deviations of these parameters from equilibrium. So for example, convection here is driven by difference in the pressure. Um, Heat is, con is, is flowing as a consequence of temperature differences or deviations from the equilibrium. And uh, reaction rates or uh, diffusion fluxes are then given in terms of the chemical potential perturbation. Now, in fact, this linear relation, flux proportional to the driving force, is very good for the diffusion. But it's not good for the reaction because very soon we are outside of equilibrium. What we then do, you know this, we just write the rate as a function of uh, the concentration of the species involved. So we use kinetic equations or master equations. What can be safely stated far away from equilibrium is that the product of rate and driving force is greater than zero. This is namely the entropy production, the dissipation. I don't have time to go into this interesting part. Um, it was shown in this publication, if you're interested in this, that um, the Gibbs energy is not the best energy to be taken for the materials we are dealing with, um, rather uh, a little bit more complex one. So if you're interested, I'll just leave it uh, here with this kind of publication. Any solid because of mass constraints has a certain termination. So you have surfaces. Then surface area is an important parameter, or the variable, I should say. And the conjugate parameter is not the chemical potential here, it's the surface tension. When you go to even smaller crystallites, then you have edges, you have corners, and all this has to be handled in the same way. But typically, it suffices to say we have the surface tension and we take it then as a function of size. And um, recently, there has been extensions called non-extensive thermodynamics, for example, by Hill, that are very well suited for these nano situations. I don't go into detail with this as well. So what we do have to consider certainly are constraints such as mass and charge conservation, continuity equations, and from electrostatics or dynamics, Maxwell's equation. Now, since we are not dealing with electric, with, with, sorry, with magnetic fields, uh, we just have to deal with Poisson's equation. This gives the relation between the curvature of the electric potential and the concentrations. This means already that we have to deal with profiles when we are at interfaces. Now you may say all this is pretty well known. Uh, it has nothing to do with the solid state. That's correct. Uh, what is specific with the solid state is, is, is just that here. So. Think of this zirconium oxide ceramic. The oxygen ions become mobile, but the zirconium ions are not. 
uh, only when you go close to the melting point, they also become sluggishly mobile and the whole oxide creeps, as it said. So it's then quasi fluid. We'll not consider this. This pressure volume term in the above equations is much more complicated in a solid because of the crystal structure. Also, I will ignore this. These locations are structure elements uh, that uh, confer some plasticity to the materials. They can be typically healed out. So what we need to consider definitely are internal interfaces, crane boundaries, for example, between, if you think of this zirconium oxide, the different crystallites that finally form the ceramic, the stone. And most importantly, and this is a major player here in the game, point defect. So if you look at the upper uh, <clears throat> row, you see here a section out of the water structure. Owing to entropy, you have a certain dissociation, which costs energy locally to be done, but there is such a dissociation. We form some HCO plus ion, some OH minus ion. <clears throat> and if you abstract from the underlying perfectly thought structure, then you have isolated in a snapshot kind of way what I call here the point defects in the phase of water, namely the excess proton, and this is the proton vacancy, as it were. Now, this is a language that we are using in solids. We have silver chloride. Only at zero Kelvin, we have this, this is this perfect structure here. Uh, at finite temperatures, we have a, if you want, a dissociation or an excitation of a silver ion from a regular side to an interstitial side. And if you do the same subtraction procedure, we have isolated the interstitial ion and the vacancy. So the usual nomenclature is so that the vacancy is abbreviated by a V for vacancy and the interstitial side by an I. What is important are these effective charges that matter. That means a charge on the left-hand column minus a charge in the middle column of this figure. And the same you have in the electron shell. Take zinc oxide. There is some disorder in the electron shell, again, only due to entropy. It costs energy. So you have some zinc plus and some O minus. This means transition from valence to conduction band. And if you abstract from the zero Kelvin situation, then you have the excess electron in the hole. It's always the same thing, always excess carrier and lacking carrier. So there's a far reaching isomorphicity, which becomes even clearer when you use the same language for all these cases that I did here. So usually the language is really a problem in this field. But here I took the language as a physicist do for a semiconductor such as silicon, where they excite the electrons from the valence to the conduction band. So you bridge the electronic gap. Now you can do the same for water. Um, you excite your proton from a water molecule, you bring it to another one. Then you uh, bridge the ionic gap in water. You can also bridge the ionic gap in silver chloride by transferring the silver ion from a regular side to an interstitial side. If the right hand side gap shrinks to zero, you know, we speak of a metal. So, here, what would we then say? We would say this is a strong electrolyte. And in the middle case, we would say this is a super ion conductor if the gap shrinks to zero, and then all the silver ions are disordered, like in uh, alpha silver iodide. Physicists insert here the Fermi level within, within the band uh, gap, and the distances to upper lower levels are measures of electron and hole concentration. If you do the same with water, so we make use of the electrochemical potential of the proton, then you see you have pH and pOH. And when you do the same for the silver chloride, you see same situation with the electrochemical potential of the silver ion. By the way, for those who are interested in this, if you are interested in a Ponsted type acid base concept for ionic crystal, do this. You just have to count the point defects because their concentrations in equilibrium reflect the acidity and the basicity, the same way as the electrons reflect the redox behavior. The phosphorus within the band gap excites the electron to the upper level. Now here you would say this is an acid, acetic acid excites the proton to the upper level, 
and you can group all assets and bases in terms of their energy levels, free energy levels. And again, the same for the silver chloride if you have an impurity and so. So what you see is what you should remember that there is a far reaching isomorphicity in the game. So let's do a lotto game here. Lotto am Mittwoch is a game here in Germany. I'm not sure about Switzerland, but probably a similar thing you have. And now we do six defects in a crystallite of 49 uh, sites. I uh, have problems here with the point of 49 sites. Yeah. Um, every crossing costs energy, but still the crosses are there because of entropy in our example here. And uh, you know how many you can do. You can have 10 to the, you can have, sorry, 14 million possibilities, namely not to gain the checkpot. That is this huge number, which is here, from which you can derive the entropy. And if you then add the local Gibbs energy necessary to form each single one, and then you end up with a Gibbs energy. And the right hand side figure, you see the Gibbs energy plotted as a function of the point defects. And what you realize is there is a minimum. That means this number is required in thermodynamic equilibrium. So you always have a number of point defects in thermodynamic equilibrium, as you have a number of H plus and OH minus ion at a certain temperature in water, and as you have a certain number of electrons in holes in silicon. Making the derivative, then you can find the chemical potential and no surprise if you uh, are dilute, you get the Boltzmann form. This is very well known, you see, for more than at least, I would say, at least 100 years. So when you are a little more precise, then this is the right expression. And you see, you have also here not the total number of sites involved, but the number of free sites, which become, of course, also a different number if you have many of the defects formed. So this is Fermi-Dirac type of statistics. So this kind of statistics follows a Fermi-Dirac type because you can um, occupy one side or cross one side only once. So Fermi-Dirac has not necessarily to do with quantum mechanics. It's like Langmuir isotherm. You have the same thing there. Now a side story that you uh, might enjoy or may not. Uh, when I wrote this book here, uh, I thought this is a nice example to illustrate all this. But since the book was in English, I would not take Lotto am Mittwoch. I thought, <laughs> let's go for an American game. And I knew from my time in Boston that there is a Megabug game. And the governor of Massachusetts is responsible for handling this and getting finally the tax out of it. It's a similar thing. So um, uh, my secretary at that time contacted the governor's office in, in Boston and um, asked for copyright. They said, it's very simple. You just have to make a copy of that page where this appears and then we grant you copyright. This is a page and you see, it's not that ticket. So we did not get copyright. Why did we not get copyright? Because we forgot on the copied page that in the footnote, it was that the low chances of winning in the lottery, which have caused it to be called a tax for the stupid. Of course, this... Um, not possibly could then be taken and accepted by the governor. But back to our theme, and let's be even a little more um, general. So we have just ground state and excited states. So we have maybe a kind of a variation of the levels, ground state levels or in the excited states, a kind of a density of states. But we just have a large band gap here. And then a quick calculation shows that then always you end up with such a Boltzmann term. The spreading here in, in energies is just then all in terms of an effective density of states put in this constant value. So if you have ions um, in a band, then you have a parabolic density of states. If you have ionic crystals, then you have the delta function, so all the vacant sites and all the industrial sites have the same energy. And surprisingly, mass action laws that follow from the chemical potentials are most well defined for ionic point defect reactions in solids, much better than for electrons and much better than for ions in liquids 
or an amorphous state because then you have a kind of a Gaussian spreading inside. But if it is dilute, you always get this. So what is behind these energy levels? The standard term, then we may have an electric potential coming from the charge, and then we have interaction. So these, this is behind the energy levels. What is more important is that the energy levels of electrons and ions need to be coupled. So let's just uh, have a look at silver chloride. Silver chloride, you have a silver ion excitation, but you also have a band gap. So you have an excitation of electrons from valence to conduction band here put upside down. I put it upside down because then this difference between the electrochemical potential of electrons and ions is just the sum. And the sum is a chemical potential of neutral silver. This is the thermodynamically most well-defined quantity. It is finally the partial pressure of silver over silver chloride. Or when you have a lithium battery, it may be then the, the self voltage of the battery. So any solid, uh, here we take an oxide MO, has a certain range of stoichiometry. So none is really a line phase. That means if it is zinc oxide, the zinc to oxygen ratio is never exactly one. Deviations may be very small, maybe 10 ppm. Then you say, oh, I'm not interested. By no means that is important for the energy. By no means this is important for the weight. Well, this is right. But the impact on the carrier concentrations is first order. So this is a lock lock plot. And you see what's going to happen when you go through that phase width. You have a huge variation of the electrons. They are going down in concentration. The holes go up in concentration. The vacancies go down in concentration. And then the digital go up in concentrations. These are often orders of magnitude effect, even though this is a very, very tiny situation. So not all of this is typically fulfilled thermodynamically. I mean, in terms of the range, because of stability region, tin oxide is an example where only the left green part is realized. So it's essentially oxygen deficit material and its end type. On the other hand, on the right hand side, lanthanum cuprate is an example of a p-type conductor where the blue part is realized. And lead oxide is an example of a classic mixed conductor uh, where you have both ions and electrons uh, in, of importance. So what you realize is that you get as a solution in the log-log plot, here these straight lines. Straight lines in log-log plot mean power laws. And this is because the concentration form power laws in the partial pressure P, in the doping content C, and in the mass action constant of the reactions that you need to write down, namely disorder reactions, um, interactions with the gas phase, all in terms of point defects, and you can handle them as mass action constant. And there, this temperature dependence finally gives the temperature dependence of the concentration. So the concentration can be varied by these three adjusted adjusting screws, partial pressure of the component that may be exchanged, temperature, and doping content. A master material that we understand very well is transient titan. It is a perovskite. On the left side, you see these kind of diagrams. You don't need to follow them in detail. But on the right side, you see conductivity curves, which exactly correspond to these predictions, qualitatively speaking, um, but not only qualitatively speaking, quant the quantitative uh, agreement is, uh, is, is amazing. So you see, for example, these power law situations, and you see the n-type conductivity going down with partial pressure. You start from a very good n-type conductor, you go through a minimum, uh, and then you change to p-type, which is a pretty poor p-type conductor. Again, with these kind of slopes. I uh, deliberately here took um, data from literature. Um, we also measured these values very, very often. I just want to mention that uh, 
we understand this material so well that we can predict these, these conductivities for ions, electrons, NP and ions uh, over a whole range of partial pressures for many, many doping concentrations um, and over a huge temperature range and partial pressure range as I already said, uh, I would say almost up a factor uh, to a factor of two or so. It's almost exact given these huge variations that you have. So now let's have a look at the kinetics. So we are changing the partial pressure, we are changing the conductivity, but we want to understand how does it occur? How fast does it occur? And this refers then to the diffusion coefficients inside the solid. Now, everybody who is concerned with diffusion in solids will realize that this is pretty much a confusion business because there are various diffusion coefficients to consider. And this has to do with the fact that there are various experiments. The simplest one is an electric experiment. This may be our zirconium oxide ion conductor. So then in the conductivity experiments, where you have reversible exchange at the boundaries, the electrons flow in the outer circuit and your ions flow in the solid. And then you can derive a conductivity of the ions, which you can convert into a diffusion coefficient. This is not a diffusion experiment because you have steady state. A real diffusion experiment would be a tracer exchange. Here you exchange outside the tracer content. So you switch maybe from one isotope to the other. And then in the middle, you have a counter diffusion of the two isotope species. And this again is a measure of oxygen ion diffusion. And this gives a diffusion coefficient, a tracer diffusion coefficient, which is very close to the previous one. Not exactly the same, but close. The next curve, the well, next uh, slide, sorry, shows calculations of a vacancy conduction step within a perovskite, which is typically used for fuel cells. It doesn't matter, but you see here, this is the octahedron in projection, and you see the oxygen in the left-hand side figure jumping from a regular side to a vacant side. Sorry for this kind of pointer that is moving around sometimes irregularly, but I think you can easily see that on the very right hand side, your oxygen is then in the final position and has freed the vacancy. In the middle, you have the transition state, very beautiful, beautifully symmetric transition state. So if this is so, you see immediately, you can handle this as a normal chemical reaction if you want. So you have a jump from here to here. Uh, you write a bimolecular chemical reaction kinetic equation for it, which you can further evaluate. And if you're close to equilibrium, this directly yields also, of course, a fixed law, diffusion law, where the flux is proportional to the gradient in the concentration. When you are going far from equilibrium, situation becomes more complicated, in particular, if your concentration is large as well. And uh, here we uh, derived uh, an equation which does very good service also for these kind of cases. Here we plug in the non-equilibrium conductivity and we have to plug in the electrochemical potential jump from one side to the other. So if you're interested here, refer to literature. Now the third experiment is now the most important one, is a chemical experiment. Because this very often happens your diffusion process changes simultaneously the composition. That's exactly what is happening when you have strontium titan at a certain partial pressure. You change your partial pressure, then oxygen moves in. Oxygen, that means ions and electrons in a coupled way, because formerly neutral oxygen goes in. So this is an ambipolar motion. And you see that this diffusion coefficient is also including properties of the electrons. This makes it so different. So we are looking in the next experiment uh, as a to the consequence of a jump in the partial pressure from here to here. So we are in the p-type regime, but we are not looking at the conductivity as a parameter to be measured. Uh, we had very nice 
examples very long ago that we did this, but it's always very nice to show and very illustrative to show. Um, we can follow the color change when we change the oxygen partial pressure and we see the oxygen diffusing in by color changes. Uh, iron is a dopant in strontium titanate and is responsible for the color change. The situation, the, the kinetics can be very complicated, but in a lumped way, you can say you have a surface reaction, which is a homogeneous chemical reaction, more or less. And then in the crystal, you have a diffusion, this chemical diffusion. So it's a coupled process. This is, of course, a complex process in itself, which is determined in its rate by the rate determining step. So now let's have a look at a situation where this right hand side part is quick, and we are looking at that. So the surface reaction part is ready terminal. Then you fill your oxide with oxygen stoichiometry homogeneously, like you fill a glass with water. And you see very boring color changes of your crystal. But from the intercept, you get very precise data for the effective rate constant. And we get beautiful information on the reaction mechanisms. Um, something that would be a different story to tell. Now we are interested more in the situation where the diffusion part is really determining. You see wonderful diffusion profiles. Note that none of these profiles is calculated or interpolated. Every point here is measured point by point as a function of position and as a function of, of time. And wonderful diffusion profiles you see here from the optical impression. The right uh, experiment uh, I will refer to in a few minutes. So you see, we measure very precisely the chemical diffusion coefficient, but we also know precisely what is in it. I will be brief here, just by saying that the kinetics gives you relaxation time. The relaxation time is uh, connected with the diffusion coefficient and with the size. A relaxation time can always somehow be written as a product of a resistance and a capacitance. So here we have a chemical resistance and a chemical capacitance. So the blue parameter, as you see from the left hand side, is given by the conductivities of ions and electrons. The red parameter, the chemical capacitance, a very important term as we realize more and more, um, is a little more complicated and is essentially given by concentrations of the defects uh, involved. We can put this on a very, very general basis, particularly when you look at this kind of potential that I mentioned briefly in the beginning. But we know what is in, that is important. And when you do then the calculation, you get, you can even predict now this kinetic quantity as if a huge temperature regime, you see, you can change it by six, not seven orders, almost 11 orders of magnitude. That is a huge variation. And this is just without any adjustable parameter. But you have to take account of internal interaction. That was something that we contributed here. We called it conservative ensemble approach. And I'll just briefly tell you what I mean um, when you have uh, an oxide, you have oxygen defects, you have electronic defects, but they also can interact. For example, if an oxygen vacancy traps an electron, it is singly, singly ionized, or if it traps two, it is just neutral. And if this interaction inside is quick, then you can always define entities that show a simple continuity equation, and then you can solve everything, and your diffusion coefficient is then composed of these two entities. So more recently, I applied this here in this uh, um, paper to a situation in a liquid electrolyte where you have different salt configurations where you have anion, cation pairs, triple pairs, and so on. And uh, you can show what the result is and how you can separate them by a multitude of different techniques. As I said, you also can have conditions, typically at lower temperatures, where the surface reaction is ready terminal. And then you can end up with these kind of surface rate constants. But you have to keep in mind that they are different as well because you have different um, 
experimental conditions. Now, without going into any detail, I just want to mention how, how I give you a flavor simply how you could approach this. And for this, I take a case study. I take a certain surface reaction. Oxygen is absorbed neutrally, and then in rate determining step, the rest occurs, just to make it simple, the absorbed oxygen goes to a vacant side and is simultaneously ionized. You see, you have red terms and blue terms and black terms. The blue terms, the vacancies, are the ones that are varied and perturbed when we do this chemical experiment where we change the geometry. The red term is the one perturbed by a tracer diffusion. And the case, the green ones here are the ones perturbed by the electric experiment because it's the only parameter that is varied. And what we vary is the electric potential, which is part of the rate concept. This you know certainly because if you evaluate this, this gives you butler Fulmer equation. But you can imagine that these two give you a similarly important um, surface kinetic expressions and equations for the other cases. Plenty of room for future work. So now let me come to the third part. Here we are dealing not with a single crystal, but with two single crystals put together, separated by a crane boundary. And in this case, the crane boundary is a rate determining part for the process. So the others are quick and you will see homogeneous profiles in the others. And what is seen indeed is just a jump over the boundary which gives you the transfer rate constant um, for this crossing of the grain boundary. So what is mechanistically behind here? This brings me to interfaces and brings me to space charge zones and brings me to our favorite field in Stuttgart, uh, nanoionics. Nanoionics means we are dealing with this. We are dealing with redistribution of ions uh, what I mean is point effects, of point effects, and of excess electrons and holes at interfaces. So we take our picture, coupled picture, coupling remains the same, but we see that we have the bending of the electronic levels as usual, but we also have the bending on the ionic field, uh, levels, and their bending is the same because they perceive the same electric field. Now the important point is indeed that we found that in almost 95% of the examples we investigated, the ionic redistribution is responsible for the field, not the electronic one, simply because you have many point effects. And then this field tells the electrons what to do. So the electronic behavior is a kind of a fellow traveler effect. So in German, we would say it's fremdbestimmt. And this, is, I would say, is a paradigm change in many fields, as you may imagine, where iron redistribution is completely ignored. And we have uh, identified a whole zoo of examples of these many examples. Uh, just for impressing you, but I don't go into detail. So they refer to electrolytes, to electrodes, to sensors, to a storage situation, to and so on. You just name it. Let me just single out, yeah, two of them I will briefly show. One is maybe an example that is most well known. These are heterolayers of two fluoride ion conductors. And the conductivity behavior of these multi layers that we did with molecular beam epitaxy is solely determined by the redistribution that is shown in the bottom picture of a fluoride from the barium fluoride space charge zone into the calcium fluoride space charge zone. And this is meanwhile extremely well understood, extremely well understood. Maybe have a look at the second reference where um, the work over at least 10 years is summarized. Here we are interested in a grain boundary, as I said. This is a grain boundary in silver chloride. And a grain boundary also can be active, namely, it can trap, absorb the silver ion, for example. And then you have two space charge zones adjacent. And strontium titanate, it, it, it is active at well, this grain boundary. And we know that this grain boundary is positively charged by ionic redistribution. And what this means is that all the positively charged 
uh, ionic carriers like the oxygen vacancies have to be depleted and the hole has to be depleted, but the excess electron because of opposite charge has to be enriched. This is a carrier situation in a single crystal. And this is a carrier situation in a nanocrystal where you have such tiny spacings of interfaces that you do not have time to go time and quotation mark to go back to the bulk because the next interface already comes and you have again something like a, hom a homogeneous situation. So what we are now doing, we compare the nanocrystal in strontium titanate is a macroscopic strontium titanate. And this indeed huge difference. This is the single crystal or the coarse grain crystal, changed from N type to P type. And we have here the, the iron conductivity part, something that we can predict very nicely, as I already mentioned in the beginning. Now let's go to a grain size of 30 nanometer. A huge change just by downsizing your crystallites. The p-type part, the p-type is depressed by three orders of magnitude. The n-type is increased by three orders of magnitude. And the middle part, the ionic part, is depressed by nominally six orders of magnitude. So in fact, the whole of the ionic conductivity has disappeared. Huge effect, huge effect, just by sizes. And the marvelous thing is, again, we can predict it. And if you then coarsen it, you go back to the initial situation again. So in the last example, before we do a break, I think you may be already tired of the many different uh, points I have addressed, um, but I find it important because in the strontium tightened example, the grain boundary effect was clearly understood, but we did not know <clears throat> a priori what charge we had. Now, this is an example where we know the charge for sure. <clears throat> this lanthanum cuprate, this is a mother material of the superconductors. And if you replace some lanthanum randomly by strontium, as shown here, <clears throat> then you increase the whole concentration, but you also increase the vacancy concentration. And this increased hole concentration in this structure at low temperatures gives rise to cooper pairs and superconductivity. Now, what we did is we collected all these positive carrier, uh, strontiums and put it in a single plane. So we make a planar structure. <clears throat> you can do this by molecular beam epitaxy again. And you replace a lanthanum oxide layer by a, sorry, sorry, sorry. You replace, yeah, a lanthanum oxide layer by a strontium oxide layer. So you get a charged plane, which is effectively negatively charged, strontium two plus instead of lanthanum three plus. And then all these effects should only happen in the space charge zones. And in fact, when you measure the conductivity, the superconductivity, I'm sorry, you see superconductivity, but only close to the interface on both sides. So this is a very clear example of this interfacial effect. So I was a little optimistic in time, but this also has to do that we started a little later. So I guess I essentially spoke for 40 minutes. Uh, this is a more fundamental part. And as I was asked, I would like to leave about five minutes for some discussion to this part before I come to a shorter second part, which is referring to two device examples. Thank you so far. Thank you, Jochen. Um, we are open to questions. Please uh, raise your hand or you can unmute yourself if you have questions. And maybe I can then start. Um, I'm wondering about um, if we go back to the nanocrystalline um, um, examples or, or systems uh, where you show the, these bands on slide 34. This one, I guess, no? Uh-huh. Yeah. So would it be correct to say that um, in these nanocrystalline systems, you expect the conductivity to be better just because you don't have any more space charge. So electronic conductivity. Now it depends on the partial pressure. 
So when you look at the next picture, <clears throat> you see it. You see that on the P type, on, on the high partial pressure side, your electronic conductivity is smaller, three orders of magnitude smaller. The ion conductivity is completely gone. But when you go to low oxygen partial pressures, you measure a higher electronic conductivity. So very, very, um, how to say, detailed uh, differences that you can check. Uh, if you ask for a practical application, I could already ima imagine one. Uh, when you look at the barium titanate capacitor, it is so that the, uh, you don't want iron conductivity in this capacitor because the capacitor um, is just, it's just an electronic ferroelectric effect. But when you have iron conduction, you get in the course of time when you have electrodes on both sides, you get some polarization, some redistribution of ions inside because of the effect of the electrodes. We later will see a similar example. And this can only happen if you have an ion conduction. So if your ion conduction is six orders of magnitude less, I would expect here that this degradation doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this with these tiny nanocrystals, if the fellow electricity would be equally good, probably would suffer. Yeah, I, th I think in general, this is a very important point because uh, even if we go to room temperature, so in, in um, for example, in water electrolysis, we often use oxides for um, electrolysis of water or, or for um, um, oxygen evolution reaction and oxygen reduction reaction. So mm -hmm. often people use nanocrystalline oxide materials, yeah. but those ones, of course, the question is how conductive they really are. And yeah. what, if you're really measuring the intrinsic activity. And I think that here, it also shows that um, in, in liquids, we can expect also, well, there, the partial PO2, of course, the equilibration will be slow, but still we yeah. can change effectively the PO2 on the surface and then have an evolution of the conductivity during any kind of electrochemical experiment with these yeah. nanomaterials. Yeah. So in nanomaterials, you can expect different conductivities if your surfaces are charged. Now, and this will typically be the case. I mean. The fact that the surface is not charged is a singularity. You just have to hit the very right point. OK, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Marcel. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for this nice introduction. I have a question to this slide, actually. So now here you are comparing a microscopic system to this nano size systems. Um, and is, is the comparison fair in the sense that is the composition actually the same? Or are these, let's say, high areas of space charge layers that accumulate in some types of defects? Is it actually changing the, the composition so much that you would expect different, like different properties? Joachim, I, I think your microphone is muted. Uh, you, you have to unmute yourself. Is it fine now? Yep. So if you, if you cause it, so you make a macrocrystalline situation out of the nanocrystalline situation, you see, you come back to the initial situation. So it's certain, that respect is reversible. No? Uh, and you, 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 all, all, you also have to understand that we, that is something that we can really, given the certain space charge potential, predict. So we, if this is depressed by three orders of magnitude, this must be enhanced by a little bit less than three orders of magnitude, if you are precise. Here, we expect from the space charge theory that this goes down by six orders of magnitude. So we don't know, in fact, that this is six orders of magnitude below, um, but it's certainly so small that it would not be seen in the total conductivity curve. But when you go back to the course and situation, you see you, you go back to it. No? I think that's pretty clear. This would not change biochemistry or something like that. So the only thing that you are changing is the following. You, your crane boundaries, they have certain properties of segregation or adsorption of carriers. And this changes in the vicinity of them in the space charge zones, the carrier distribution. If you take the boundary back, so to speak, if you kneel it out, then this effect is gone again. No? OK, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, please go ahead, Yogesh. 
Yeah, thank you for the great, great talk. I had a, um, a question about the anisotropy of the conductivity effects at an interface. Because there, you know, the 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 transfer across the interface boundary is, of course, in, in influenced dramatically by the electrostatic potential drops at the interface. But the but the change in carrier concentration might cause a differential effect on the lateral transport. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, later I'll show maybe a little example on it in a different context. Um, so. That was in initially our interest in these kind of interfacial systems came exactly from the parallel part. So I'll give you one example. When um, it was very much not, it was not understood why a material like lithium iodide, which is a weak ion conductor, can be increased in conductivity, ion conductivity, by three orders of magnitude by just plugging in aluminum oxide particles which is insulating. So, and we, 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 that was the initial story and that was also our interest to uh, identify this and to find out what the mechanism is. And then we did a variety of other experiments that this is a phenomenon that's very general. So the reason here is the aluminum oxide particles are sitting in the grain boundaries. They are um, absorbing the silver ions and it's exactly that lateral conductivity that is induced, namely an enhanced vacancy concentration in the adjacent recent, uh, regions that uh, does the effect. So these are new, which these kind of effects, if, if they are percolating, that is of course important. No? Uh, we did uh, other experiments that may be interesting in this context. We uh, measured um, grain boundaries in silver chloride, so a polycrystalline material. And then you could, by impedance spectroscopy, you could even see both, both. So you have space charge zones that are highly conducting, but that is not the whole thing. When you go through the space charge zone, you also have some, some core effect, no? structurally speaking, that might be blocking. So we had an effect that was blocking when you went across, but highly conducting when you went along. And the crossing effect you can see in impedance spectroscopy at, 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 at low frequencies. And the other one is short circuiting the bulk and it's seen at high frequencies. So you can really see on coarsening and on sintering, you can see that one semicircle is increased, the other shrinks. So you are completely right with this, yes. If I can just do a small follow-up, I'm curious, have you seen that that parallel conductivity changes uh, at the interface boundary, do they accrue primarily for changes in the vacancy population or is there also a mobility effect? So we can at least explain our results um, without uh, taking account of mobility effects. Okay. That is so because the concentration uh, variations are orders of magnitude. I would not say the mobility does not change, but the variation is just completely I show later, I will later show us an example with the photovoltaics where this occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more question that I'll ask and we will um, proceed. So if, can, can you go to the slide number 21? Is there, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was Doesn't really barrier. Matter. I mean, in principle, I can just ask as is, it's okay. Oh, I just can't get out here. I don't know why I'm stuck. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, no, it may go. Yeah. So what was the number? Um, 21. 21. Yeah. So just, just a general question, I think for many special students in the audience will be interesting. Um, in your opinion, how predictable these um, barriers are from the first principles today? Yeah, I mean, um, oh, I'm, I'm normally choking with the theorists in my department. I'm saying, if I give you a wrong experimental result and you come back to me and you say, oh, this experiment was wrong, then I believe you. <laughs> because uh, you have a lot of- Interesting maps. You probably know it's a mystic modeling. Uh, and it's very hard to get out conductivity values from maybe DFT. But the experience is that the thresholds, the migration energies or the activation energies or so, 
they come out, at least at certain systems, quite uh, reliably. Okay. Okay. I think we can proceed. Thank you. Good. So let me just um, get to the point again, where I left. Hmm. So we are here. So what I now will do is uh, I would like to, and I will stick here with that mouse, it's probably um, better to follow. Um, we'll, we'll refer to two types of devices, and I will show that these solid set ionics considerations are simply very important for all of them. Um, Lithium-based battery, to start with, has an electrolyte in the middle that is very often liquid, but uh, many, many people look at also at, at solid state. And now there are good lithium ion conductors. At least the electrode is a typical solid in which ion and electron redistribution is just to the four. Um, electrolyte we have been looking into as well in terms of um, looking at composites. So we had liquids, we plugged in second phase solid particles, which exactly did what uh, was asked before, namely they absorb ions and this ion absorption can increase the conductivity of the counter ion. Uh, it can also be very helpful for transference numbers. We call this socket sand electrolytes, but I will not talk about the electrolyte. I will talk about the electrode. The same story. The electrode is a mixed conductor and it has a certain width of stoichiometry, like in the oxide. This width will be much larger because you want to store a lot. It's the only difference in a way. But when you go through this kind of diagram, you will see it looks very similar. Now, the important point is that from this diagram, you can directly derive the charge discharge curve for this kind of intercalation process. Because the lithium activity could also be the lithium partial pressure over the lithium compound um, can be converted to the cell potential. And if you subtract interstitials and vacancy concentrations, I and B, then you get the amount of lithium stored. So you have your curve. And this gives rise to such S-shape charge discharge curve that you typically see in such an intercalation situation. And as you also realize, it's completely parameterized by mass action laws of the point defect reaction. Now you may say, this equilibrium, what about kinetics? Now kinetics are very often diffusion controlled. So controlled by the conductivities. The conductivities can also be inferred from here as long as you stay not too far from equilibrium. So in spite of this, sometimes frustrated to say that not very many groups in the world are just doing this. So intercalation is only one thing. So you can have an oxide, you put a little lithium in it, maybe 10%. And then you may start to form a lithium richer compound. That would be a phase change, also an important reaction, particularly let's say iron phosphate, lithium iron phosphate is a prominent example. This may be lithium cobalt oxide. And if you add even more, then you can decompose your ternary down to lithium oxide in the metal. This is a decomposition reaction. You have, if you look how much lithium you can enter per metal, this is huge. But of course, you're ending up with a phase mass and it's hard to get it reversible. And this is something of special interest, uh, namely for us, namely the possibility of storing lithium at the interface. And you have many interfaces here in such a regime. It's good to have a model material. So here we are not having strontium titanate as a model material, but ruthenium oxide. So we start out with ruthenium oxide. It can take only a little lithium before you have a phase change to lithium ruthenate. Lithium ruthenate, you see quite a decent intercalation. You see this kind of S shape that I just mentioned. And then you have a huge capacity coming from the decomposition, forming lithium oxide and ruthenium. And then there is something that is beyond what you would have expected if you ignore the interfaces, but you also have interfaces and this is obviously interfacial storage. So let's uh, consider this intercalation again. 
um, we considered a variety of electrodes and looked in the defect chemistry. I don't want to repeat this. Maybe I'll just um, say a few words with regard to the kinetics. So how is the kinetics? Is kinetics of lithium in cooperation, electrons from here and ions from the electrolyte, or there's a current collector, the electrolyte, is a chemical diffusion. And the chemical diffusion relaxation time is a storage time. The storage time is proportional to the square of size and inversely proportional to the chemical diffusion coefficient. Now, chemical diffusion coefficient at room temperature, now we are at room temperature, is not pretty much quicker than 10 to the minus 10 centimeters square per second. If your electrode particle is a millimeter thick, it takes a PhD work, a single PhD work for a single charging or discharge. Now, when you go to 10 nanometer, <clears throat> five orders of magnitude in size, you gain 10 orders of magnitude in time. That means milliseconds. That's very quick. Well, that sounds like a beautifully simple solution. But as you see here, you have to address all these very small particles, all of them sufficiently well by electrons and ions. This is now the problem. Morphology or circuitry is a problem. So we have done um, very interesting analysis recently, uh, essentially here I want to mention Rapiosiskin and now it's with Argon. Uh, we looked namely in the kinetics and uh, in literature this is not well considered um, because these kind of electrode particles themselves have of course, and they contribute to the conductivity process inside, not just to the diffusion. And this is an example where the electrode is pretty well ionically conducting. And then your, elect your, 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 elect I'm sorry, your ionic contact, so this is the electrolyte, can be pretty relaxed. You don't need the electrolyte to penetrate deep down to any particle because your particle itself is ionically conducting. So we call this wiring length. So wiring length for the ion can be much larger than that for the electron. The electron contact must be very intimate because it's not a good electron conductor. So all this requires um, <clears throat> a, quite a deal of modeling, but I think the result is uh, qualitatively intelligible. So morphology is really the clue for having a good electrode material. So here is a nice morphology that we came up with for tin particles. Tin is a good host for lithium but it can crack and all sorts of things. Diffusion is not fast. So, but if you have small particles mechanically decoupled in a carbon fiber, this is a wonderful electrode. So what this figure should show is <clears throat> that the complexity of an electrode is comparable to the complexity of an integrated circuit or to a neural network. Not for the fact that we have complexities to to electronic uh, processes and to ionic processes only. Here we have to have both ionic and electronic effects coupled. You might have seen that the right hand side part in the facial storage, when you have lithium oxide and ruthenium, offers a capacity that is similarly shaped here as a curve as it is in the intercalation. This is now exactly matching our results that I showed at the end, what we call nano-ionics. By the way, the fact that you have quite a decent capacity is simply due that this ruthenium lithium oxide composite is indeed a nanocomposite. So you have many, many interfaces as this TM picture shows. So what is behind? <clears throat> so imagine you have a composite of a blue and a red phase. The blue phase can only store electron, has no room for lithium plus. The red phase has room for lithium plus, but it may not accommodate, be able to accommodate the electron because maybe there's no transition metal ion in it or so. But the total nanocomposite can act as an artificial electrode and storing <coughs> quite an amount of, of lithium. And this can be thermodynamically wonderfully treated with our concepts, but also the kinetics. By the way, in simple cases, uh, your lithium activity is uh, following a power law in the stored charge. Not too dissimilar from a bulk storage, but the exponents are very different. 
so you can really distinguish. It can also be quick. So when you would like to check something <laughs> reversibly at room temperature, you are better off with silver conductors because they are much faster. That's why I've been used as a model materials for beetium silver iodide, which is a silver super ion conductor, and graphite, which is a very good electron conductor. Both of them cannot store silver. <clears throat> Rubidium silver iodide cannot accommodate the electron. The graphite cannot accommodate the silver plus. But the composite has a wonderful charge discharge curve. You can have a silver excess part, obviously silver interstitials here and electrons there, but you can also have a silver deficiency part. You can put your vacancies here and you get your holes on the other side. So this can be wonderfully analyzed and it is also very quick. It is quick for two reasons. One is you have this supercapacitive, so to speak, charging through the different um, parts. So ion conduction here, electron conduction there. But you can also have diffusion along the layers that are stored. So this is true diffusion. And when you calculate and measure the diffusion coefficient uh, for these layers here, is the highest diffusion coefficient ever seen at room temperature. 10 to the minus three centimeters square per second is new, which, but of course it's a heterogeneous one. <clears throat> the second highest, in fact, uh, room temperature we have measured also in Stuttgart, that is lithium in a bilayer of graphene. It's an order of magnitude lower, but it's still higher than sodium chloride chemical diffusion in liquid water. A final word with regard to um, this um, range where you have a conversion reaction, decomposition, because it has such a high capacity that it's really tempting to do something here. It's actually not too bad. So when you have ruthenium lithium oxide and you take the lithium out, you form at least partly ruthenium oxide back. It may sound surprising, but it's simply due to the fact that because of tiny size, there are almost no diffusion distances to overcome. But I like much better the next example. Because this reaction confinement, it shows how one can really make such a reaction reversible. The answer, storage in a nano dot ensemble. And here we are dealing with molybdenum sulfide that undergoes a conversion reaction to molybdenum lithium sulfide. You see, you can plug in four lithium per metal, this is huge. And you have this carbon layer full of most tiny uh, molybdenum sulfides. So it is just as small as you can do it. It's one single layer in one direction, four nanometer in the other directions. By the way, the EMF is different from the bulk EMF. We can calculate this and we can also realize it. So when you do a very quick rough calculation, you would estimate that because of the surface effects, the surface energies, you get a reduction by pretty much half a volt. This is good here because molybdenum sulfate would like to be used then as an anode. And we measure something like uh, almost half a volt, so 400 millivolt. And <clears throat> you see cycling numbers here, thousand, and this is a capacity. It's a cycling behavior as, as good as a typical intercalation compound after certain conditioning period for lithium. <clears throat> for sodium is not exactly as good, but it's also fine. And I'm personally a fan of sodium uh, batteries. And if you are interested in what we wrote in a recent review about sodium versus lithium, uh, just please check it. Second example, where solid ionics proved very worthwhile and um, it's not really considered <laughs> is photovoltaics. You know, the photovoltaic community is very much in favor of uh, such a perovskite in which the electron hole formation is done. And then you have some neighboring phases which make sure that electrons and holes are just separated. So here you deal with a perovskite that is not an oxide con uh, perovskite. These pink balls are um, halides, typically big iodide. And the cations are also big, 
So in the middle, you have cesium, not strontium, cesium plus, not strontium two plus. And in the middle of the octahedra here, you have lead two plus uh, and not um, titanium four plus. But otherwise, it is a perovskite and is a mixed conductor, as we saw, not too different. And in fact, our interest came and um, rose when <clears throat> Michael Kratzel gave a talk in our institute <clears throat> about these kind of perovskites. And he mentioned a variety of so called anomalies in the perovskite field and the Hela perovskite field, like hysteresis, <clears throat> like high apparent dielectric constants. People thought it's ferroelectric, but in fact, the apparent dielectric constant would be even much higher than for a typical ferroelectric. And it's not ferroelectric. We measured this. At least dielectric constant is pretty normal. No, it's just what you expect for a mixed conductor. You also have to take account of the ion conductivity. Imagine you have a mixed conductor and you measure the electron conductor, the total conductivity. And the way you measure the total conductivity. And what this does is it blocks naturally the ions. And then, besides some space charge effects, which I ignored here, you get a stoichiometric polarization. You go through that phase width, if you remember that very tiny phase width, you go through it from the left to the right. And when you do a, a galvanostatic step like stimulus, your voltage initially makes a jump owing to the total resistor resistance. <clears throat> Both are conducting ions and electrons. In the steady state, only the electrons are conducting, and then you are only left with electronic resistor. The time behavior is a typical diffusion behavior. It starts with a square root t and then ends up with an exponential for longer times. And when you do a sinusoidal stimulus, you have the high frequency response, which corresponds to the jump, and you have the Warburg diffusion, initially square root t behavior, and then, sorry, a 45 degree increase, and then semi uh, circular behavior corresponding to these kind of two different square routine exponential behaviors. So if you finally use a triangular stimulus, you get a hysteresis. Then you we measured <clears throat> electronic and ionic conductivities. We did such a galvanostatic polarization curve. And then we saw a textbook-like polarization curve, a jump here, saturation, this is square root t behavior. Here you see it here. This is an exponential behavior. <clears throat> Both regimes give the same diffusion coefficient, the same relaxation time. You can do other experiments to make sure that you have partly an ion conductor. For example, this one. You take your MAPI, as I briefly call it, you switch it as an electrolyte, as it were, between two <clears throat> electrodes that are characterized by different iodine partial pressure, or that are open to different iodine partial pressures. If your MAPI is a pure ion conductor, you get nonst equation result, nonst voltage. And if it is a pure electron conductor, you get zero. You see what you get is pretty close to nonst voltage. These are conditions where MAPI obviously is a predominantly an ion conductor. But all this depends on partial pressure of iodine. Now, do you remember these kind of plots? Now we do not have the oxygen partial pressure, we have the iodine partial pressure. And <clears throat> without going into detail, you might realize that this looks very similar as for strontium titanate otherwise. Slopes are a little different because of the different charges. And when we measure the ion the electron conductivity, we follow for the whole this part and for the ions this part. So we have very clearly separated them, the electronic and ionic conductivity. We made a multi-method approach, all sorts of NMR that you might imagine, trace experiments to show that it is iodide conduction, that it is the ion iodide vacancy that is most mobile, that the methyl ammonium is only very slightly mobile and even more mobile than the lead. It's almost completely immobile. This is not very surprising to us because we came from that part of solid state ionics. But one thing was surprising to us 
namely that we found that the ion conductivity can be increased by illumination. That was very uh, illuminating to us in a way even. Um, what could be the, the reason? Now you see, your, iod, your, your hole that you form is trapped and the valence band orbitals are made of iodine. <clears throat> so your hole in the localized picture is an iodine zero. An iodine zero is small. It can go to interstitial side and can be further stabilized. So such effects that is, are called self-trapped hole are not unknown in the alkali halide business. So what never has really considered is that you free vacant sites by this and they we consider responsible for the effects measured. And this would be reversible. But when you switch off slides, it's gone. So it shows here on light intensity, both ion and electron conductivity go up. Yeah, we already then very soon, we, 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 we dreamt about applications, um, you know, to speak, light triggered electrochemical devices. You can imagine if you can trigger the uh, ion conductivity of an electrode or whatever, that will be very nice. But unfortunately, so far, we have not found material other than uh, these kind of halides that are unfortunately very unstable otherwise. But we are still looking for them. We would have a variety of applications already. I'm choking cancer here. We already have a name for it. <laughs> but this device we already have constructed, in fact. This is, can be simply MAPI that acts as an iodine permeator the permeation rate of which can be very much changed by illumination. But you could also think about uh, triggering electrode function or electrolyte function. So this may be something for the future as well. Disadvantages of this ion conduction are the following. So MAPI is pretty unstable against oxygen, against water. Now it's also, it doesn't like light at all. In fact, that is a surprising thing. You form electrons and holes, but you form all of these iodine aggregates. And on increased time, all of these neutral aggregates can move out. And they can move out. And since on the illumination, you have a high effective iodine chemical potential, you may be out of the range such that when you stop illumination, that the material decomposes. That's exactly what you observe on a very long run. Second uh, consequence is what has been observed in literature, namely what is called photodemixing. So if you have a mixture of iodide and bromide, methyl ammonium as cations, it is seen that at least partly under illumination, it demixes in these two pure phases, more or less pure phases, not completely, but more or less pure phases. And this is partly reversible. Our explanation is the following. Uh, we have varied um, cations and anions in the MAPI and investigated the photoionic effect. So the cation exchange doesn't change the picture. Still, you have it. But if you replace the iodine by the bromine, it's no longer there. The reason is that the bromine is not so polarizable that you get such a self-trapping. And um, it is so that the holes are much more delocalized than the bromide. <clears throat> So in order to make use of the Gibbs energy gain of the self-trapping, it is favorable to form an iodine-rich environment around the hole. And this would favor segregation. And when you switch off the light, it goes back. We measured the photo-induced miscibility gap, but not for MAPI so far we did a, um, more complicated so-called Diane Jacobson uh, compound, but we are now also looking for, for, for MAPI, but it's the same thing. It's also here photo unmixing. What also has been found in literature is <clears throat> that this unmixing into two phases disappears when you go to nanocrystallite situation to very small systems. This is not unknown in other fields as well. So it's, for example, known that um, the miscibility gap that you have in the system lithium iron phosphate <clears throat> disappears when your crystallites are very small. And the generally accepted reason is that 
the interfaces that have to form then contribute significantly to the cost of unmixing and may overcompensate again. And when you uh, make a very quick calculation in terms of surface tension and so on, you would calculate um, that this, this appears approximately uh, at sizes smaller than about 15 nanometer, which agrees with, with literature results, which also conforms with the miscibility gap interaction parameter derived from it. So <clears throat> solid ionics can offer a lot of adjusting screws. Think of the CPT parameter, not speaking about temperature. The P means partial pressure. So the ideal partial pressure or the stoichiometry can change the defect concentrations, ionic and electronic. Doping can equally do this. And we have a variety of examples considered sodium doping, oxygen doping. But now in the remaining time, let me just look at this nanoionic part where we use interfaces as uh, adjusting screws, so to speak. Not a cream boundary, but the following. Let me go back to this situation with the silver halide and the influence of ion conductivity by interfaces. We could do this by a second phase that absorbs the silver ion. I remember just that question that was asked in the discussion that was aluminum oxide, and then you form vacancies here, and this gives rise to very high conductivity pathways. <clears throat> When you have two different silver conductors, maybe silver iodide and silver chloride, then you have a partial transfer, like in a PN junction. <clears throat> when you have a grain boundary, this grain boundary can act absorbing, maybe on the cation. <clears throat> but also a gas phase can act absorbing, like the aluminum oxide particle. And then you measure the conductivity on the surface. <laughs> so those of you who know this Taguchi sensor where oxygen is sensed by tin oxide electronic conductivity effect sees that this is just the analog. It's a beautiful sensor for ammonia. <coughs> Sorry. Now, not surprised, we are not surprised by the fact to see that also here similar effects appear and we are looking at the important interface not only aluminum oxide MAPI, but also titanium oxide MAPI. We found to uh, anticipate the result that we have a positively charged interface and we have indication that here the lead two plus cation <clears throat> is absorbed. So what would be the consequence of a positive charge on the different carriers at different partial pressures? So let's have a look at high partial pressures there we have holes and we have iodine vacancies. So if you have a positive charge, the positively charged carriers, vacancies and holes, both have to be depleted. So we then expect <clears throat> depression of the ion and the electron conductivity at the interface. If we go to low of ion partial pressure, <clears throat> the conduction electrons come into the game and we expect a depression of the vacancy and probably even an increase of the electronic conductivity. Now, all this is beautifully seen in the composite results. Yeah, a little difficult to explain. So let me show you the second experiment that we did. We took aluminum oxide here. We put MAPI on it. We changed the thickness. And we measured the lateral conductivity. And we separated ion and electronic conductivity. And we took different ion and partial pressures. So when you're at high iodine partial pressure or at low, all the cases, if you do have this, you will measure a straight line, conductance versus thickness. The slope will be the bulk value. And we made sure that this indeed is a bulk value that we knew. The intercept admittedly is very small, but everything is extremely reproducible and at least 20 times measured. And no doubt about at least the qualitative point that at high partial pressures, both ion electronic conductivity show depressed conductivities at the interface. And here, the ion conductivity is depressed, but the electronic one at low iodine partial pressure is increased, very strikingly increased. 
So we end up with a space charge potential of about half a volt. So what's the consequence? <clears throat> this is a complicated figure. Again, please do not look at the details. It was constructed here by my coworker David de Moya, Marpi Tetenia. Um, what you just should concentrate on is the difference between the blue and the black. <clears throat> the black curve shows now the boundary effects if we consider electron and ion redistribution as just as it should be. If you ignored the ion redistribution, you would end up with the blue one. Already you see one difference the valence band that the whole concentration owing to the ion effect is much lower than if, if you ignored it. And this might directly be an explanation for the low uh, interfacial recombination that you observe in these kind of materials. What we also want to do now in future is to use this kind of situation where we now go to to situations where the space charge zones overlap. Remember, strontium titan in nanocrystals or in the calcium fluoride, barium fluoride, where you can reach the situation very nicely. So that is the end. Um, let me summarize. I hope I convinced you that uh, solid state electrochemistry uh, here um, named solid state ionics is of great importance for material science, particularly for energy research, but also information research, if you think of sensors. But more than that, generally for chemistry, every chemical reaction is, um, you need to consider the point effects as a reactive particles for which you write direction equations. In catalysis, it's largely ignored, unfortunately, when you have a metal vacancy on a surface, maybe a, a metal oxide, nothing is more um, basic than a metal vacancy, not because the metal ion is, is lacking. You have only O2 minus yeah, and compensate. And if you look at solid state physics, these very nice interfaces that the physicists come up with, they never really consider ion redistribution, at least during preparation, this, this should matter because ion redistribution near a few nanometers should mostly be possible. So if you are not interested in all of this, I'll leave you with a minimum message here. <laughs> chemistry is not just chemistry of the perfect state. It's also uh, defect chemistry that you need to consider. You know this very well for, for water, you know this very well for silicon, but typically it's ignored for more complex uh, situations. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Um, we are open to questions, so uh, um, maybe I can quickly comment one of the previous slides about the physics community, at least from what I know that in, um, in the um, condensed matter physics, they normally, well, to some extent, they started to consider the fact that in vacuum, you can lose oxygen from the surface. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, especially in the photo emission community where it's super yeah. important and they probe just the very surface layer. Yeah. Um, but this is something that has to be con considered, of course, much um, better than what's what's happening now. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, also in the field of the high DC superconductors, people have become aware of the point effects. Now you can change the geometry. But this one thing, uh, the, another thing is um, this kind of ion electron redistribution mutually influencing each other via the same field. Mm -hmm. And that is an important point that. Um, when you look at the look at a typical photovoltaic textbook or whatever, you see everything discussed in terms of band bending of the electronic levels. And the field is discussed uh, just by asking yourself, what would the electron like to do? Would it like to go from here to here? Or, this is all not relevant because what is relevant for the field that dictates electronic behavior is and the examples I've shown to you, the ionic redistribution. So you have to ask the ions, what would you like to do? And then the electrons follow you. That's a very different story. No, I agree. Uh, we have a question from Christian. Thank you. Um, on slide 45, you have shown a sketch of a battery active material 
and from the right side electrons were coming and from the left side lithium ions were coming so my question is in many practical situations for example in solid state batteries you would have the reduction at the at a at triple phase boundaries so at one side so my question is is there a difference in the transport mechanism or in the conductivity if like lithium ions and electrons would be transported in a coupled way so that effectively just neutral lithium you would diffuse into the active material uh, in principle there's no difference between liquid and in solids uh, so Let's have a look at, um, let's say this were, was a, a single crystal, no? And the electron would come from the current collector and the ions, this would be the electrolyte contact. What would, what, how does it occur? How does the lithium diffusion occur inside? So if your material is a very good electron conductor, you can say this very quick, your lithium is virtually uh, discharged here and diffuses from the left to the right. If your material is a good ion conductor, the opposite happens, your lithium diffuses from the right to the left. Now, if you have a, mic, a, a mixed conducting situation, maybe 50-50, what happens, just to anticipate this, is that your lithium, lithium is discharged and diffuses ambi, in an ambipolar fashion equally from the left to the right. So 50-50 moves from the left to the right. This is a one-dimensional situation. Now, in order to see what is going on, like here, you have to consider a higher dimensional situation. Here we did the 2D modeling. Yeah. And this 2D modeling gives us advice how far from a certain maybe aggregate or particle the next ionic and the next electronic contact has to be. And if you have a material which is a good, an electrode material which is a good ion conductor, you see, you have to be very relaxed can be very relaxed with your ionic contact. So if this is solid and you don't want the solid to penetrate, you want it to stick at the surface, then you make sure that your electrode particle is a good ion conduct, otherwise it will not work. Mm. Thanks. And vice, versa, and vice versa. So this is, I think, also for the solid electrolyte is a very important information that you should, if, if you have a, not a good ionic conductor, you have to make sure that your, uh, uh, and conductor also penetrates inside. No? It has to be embedded in it, maybe in a classy matrix or in a polymer electrolyte or so, or you make a combination of liquid and solid. Mm. Thanks. Okay, um, maybe I can, okay, Hans, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question regarding this galvanostatic polarization experiment with the ion blocking electrode. So if I understand it correctly, so conceptually, this is quite simple to like a Bruce Vincent polarization experiment in a, a liquid electrolyte. So I'm wondering, and as you drew it also here, you changed the concentration significantly across the channel. So in your experiment, I guess then also the diffusion coefficient and maybe also the transference number changes across the channel while you do the polarization experiment. Is this relevant in your case here? Or do you see any evidence uh, for this in, in your polarization experiment or in the impedance spectroscopies? Yeah, just maybe historically, uh, this kind of so-called wagner hepp experiments they have been developed in the 90s, 30s, 40s. I'm sorry, I just need to connect here. We have been talking about batteries, so let's make use of it here. So good. Um, this is very old. This is called a wagner hepp polarization. And Bruce uh, Vincent method then used wagner hepp method for a liquid, not ion electron, but cation anion is the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Right? So it's a polarization inside. And um, transference number here, this is a first order calculation. So you consider the conductivities and transference numbers close to equilibrium to be constant. Now, if you, in, if you plug in this as well, it becomes very complicated, but it also can be solved. So was that your question? Maybe I'm... Yeah, the, uh, essentially this, 
I was wondering if you see any evidence for this changing of the either transference number or diffusivity in your electrochemical experiments that you do and where you showed the results on the next slide. So what we are typically, so let's say the Wagner head polarization is a little bit, it's a little bit more general. They take a reversible electrode on one side and the iron blocking on one side. Huh? Then you mm -hmm. can get some information from the dependence on the voltage. Yep. The experiment that was initially by Yokota, also in the 1940s or so, um, that is a symmetric polarization. So what we showed here is that you can get the full variation of transference number if you make very small variations, mm -hmm. but you do a sequence of different methods uh, with the help of which you start at different initial stoichiometries. Yeah? You start always with different initial stoichiometries and then you do a very small signal pol a polarization. Then you okay. get information on the transference number, pretty precise. Yeah. Okay, and maybe one quick follow up on the next slide. I'm just wondering, in your polarization for the specific voltage that you're applying, how much are the concentration, uh, concentrations changing here from one side to the other in your setup? Um, don't have these numbers um, at heart, uh, but you see the current was two nano amps, pretty small. No? Yeah. So, and you see also this almost a textbook like of situation. So I guess the variations of concentration must be pretty small. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question about the ambipolar diffusion. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious about your opinion. So, so far we've been, you've been discussing the, um, the thermodynamic picture um, of, of this uh, system. So, but if we go to say um, quantum mechanics, so we know that the, the electrons, of course they have their own bands, they have their own uh, Fermi surfaces and all this. So the ambipolar diffusion, say in lithium cathode materials, for example, yeah. a lithium plus electron diffusing together, mm -hmm. um, does that depend on the electronic structure to some extent? Can we really pinpoint some experiments that show it or um, the dependence is so weak that we can completely ignore it and just treat it in a, in a conventional thermodynamic approach? I mean, um, <clears throat> for, for this, um... Phenomenological um, description, you need the conductivities of the electrons and you need the concentration of the electrons. No? The yeah. concentration of electrons, if you have a decent band gap, is pretty much safe. The mobility can be measured and calculated. Of course, it will somehow also depend on the filling of the band and the evolution of the band structure. Uh, the problem is different. So if you consider um, oxide material, there are very tiny uh, variations in the concentration. When you look at the electrode filling material, you need 10% or so. No? If 10%, then of course you never have a rigid band. Now you change your situation a lot. That would mean thermodynamically you have to plug in activity coefficients that do not only come from Fermi Dirac, so saturation statistics, but also from interactions. So no one has plugged in this. Very complicated. We now are trying to model a filling of uh, iron phosphate nanocrystal, nanocrystal because it doesn't show a gap. So you can fill it from iron phosphate to lithium iron phosphate. Mm -hmm. but this description is very complicated, not so much from the iron point of view, but from the electron point of view, because um, you, if you, even if you plot a kind of a band structure and you have a density of states and you put 10% lithium in it, this would predict you a metal, no? Mm -hmm. But it's never a metal. They are all heavily, heavily localized. So you can say whatever you do, you get your own band structure and your density of states changes with any composition. So it's probably better just to look at a very localized defect chemical description. Hmm. Okay. So I think that is safer than starting from than starting from quantum mechanics. Okay. Another question is about the um, the capacitive interfaces, these co-working interfaces that you showed um, previously, uh, where you have I think you had lit. Um, what we call um, sharing? Is that the yeah? If you can show this slide, it would be 
So that was ruthenium lithium oxide? Oh, no, no, no. I think it was uh, with graphite on one side as electron source, and then you had um, an ionic source. I think it's, yeah, like 51, 52. Oh, I said, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here you said that this job sharing diffusion is really fast, but it can't happen within the, say, uh, um, ionic crystal because th there are no electrons. But let's suppose mm -hmm. you do very similar experiment that you did in photovoltaics. So you use um, light with sufficient um, photon energy to excite electrons in directly in this ionic material. Would you expect a similar chemical diffusion? So you're talking about about chemical diffusion of electron sources? Or? Of the, this job sharing chemical diffusion of uh, mm -hmm. silver ion plus electron. Yeah, yeah. The one that you, you show with the red yeah. dot on the right. Mm -hmm. So you are now asking what is going to happen when you illuminate or? Uh, no, if you, so here you supply electrons to the interface and there is a job share, well, a, a joint. You apply, you apply essentially silver from this side, no, by. Yep. Yeah. But electrons are also present. So you need that electrons. electrons silver means silver plus and electrons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So silver comes from here, silver plus goes in there and the electron go in there. You can do it electrochemically or chemically, no? Uh, right, but uh, the the ionic crystal itself, say um, this rubidium um, silver iodide, yeah. um, does not have electrons. So by itself, it doesn't conduct silver so quickly, right? As this interface. If the silver diffusion were to occur only in the blue phase, it would be very very sluggish. Uh, right. Because, so like, uh -huh. yeah, because the electrons are, um, um, are not very well conducting in here. I see. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't take up electrons, and it also the electrons are not very well conducting. So the chemical diffusion coefficient, the normal one, in mm -hmm. ruby, oh, it's actually seen here. You see, that's a chemical diffusion coefficient in ruby rubidium silver iodide. If mm -hmm. this was a single crystal and everything would happen here, it would be orders of magnitude below. No, mm -hmm. so this is a chop sharing diffusion. We call it. It has similarity to supercapacitor, of course, because you could also say, ah, I do a supercapacitive charging. Um, but you can also diffuse it along the layers where you get your storage. And this would be then a diffusion. So what we do at the moment, that might be an interesting point here to say, we want to understand the storage in a given phase from the center to the interface. So bulk including Interface. This will be a generalization of battery and supercapacitor, if, if you want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are doing now by looking in storage as a function of thickness. In the layered structure. In the oh. intercalation electrode. Yeah. No? You, you put it in the intercalation electrode, but you also have something in excess at the interface. Mm -hmm. If you look at it as a function of thickness, then you will only increase eventually the bulk thickness and the other one stays as an off offset that you can separate. Mm -hmm. So then you finally get a picture of your storage, the profile from the interface into the bulk. Okay, but my question was, um, so also about this um, rubidium iodide, um, silver iodide regarding the light excitation. So if you provide those electrons just by exciting with light. Which electrons? This? Um, no, no, no. If you just look at the, um, say the very left one, the left the silver plus electron, in this case. Um, so this is chemical diffusion classical, but you said that there are just no electrons to go. So the problem is not in the amount of electrons. The problem is with the mobility of electrons. Then. Yeah. Yeah. But these their electrons come from the neutral silver that you apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you, you're asking when you illuminate, you get some additional electrons or so? Yes. This would not matter too much other than that you uh, change your chemical capacitive term in the diffusion coefficient because you already have electrons in there. That's correct. That would change the, that would change the diffusion coefficient, yeah. Mm. That's okay. Uh, okay, I think that well, we have one question from the chat also regarding 
the importance of tuning ionic conductivity and maybe some strategies in the solid state batteries. Because uh, I think that we have um, a plenty of people from the solid state battery community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question refers to uh, varying the ion conductivity in the electrolyte or in the electrode? I, I would say um, electrolyte probably because the electrodes are similar yeah, to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, electrolyte, um, you want to have a, a well conducting electrolyte, you need to fulfill stabilities and so on. Um, so we, we did, when you ask what we did, so we, 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 we varied conductivities in liquid electrolytes. Uh, we, we separated um, conductivities of anions and cations and ion pairs and triple pairs. It, and mm. We could because we relied on this concept of conservative ensembles, which showed us when you do an uh, AC experiment, a DC experiment, you do a PFG NMR experiment for anion, one for the cation, then you get the full story. It's a little complicated and involved evaluation, but in principle, it works. We had done some case study. And then the nice thing is what I like pretty much is when you then add something to it, a solid like silica. This silica in certain systems absorbs preferentially the anion. So you can even break up ion pairs, you get more carriers in the vicinity, and you can have some enhanced conductivities around. So this is not too much an issue in the, in the electrolytes because they are already well conducted. Now you would not see very much on this. But what is more important, you immobilize the anion. So your transference number becomes, becomes more and more cation-like. You yeah. want to avoid anion conductivity because you get polarization inside. No? Yeah. Then the situation of a highly filled liquid with adsorptive properties of the solid becomes more and more like an ion exchange membrane, yeah? mm -hmm. where your anion is covalently bound, like a nephion. So as a, I think a lot could be done in this kind of liquid solid composites, but uh, a lot of experiments need to be, be done as well because of yeah. stability and all sorts of things. OK, thank you so much. I, I'm not seeing any more questions. So maybe at this point, then we can um, finish the colloquium today. So uh, Joachim, yeah. very, we really appreciate your um, your talk and your uh, participation in this discussion. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very nice discussion as well. Great, thank you. Bye. Right. See you. So if you have questions, just write me or so. Yeah, we, we don't encourage it too strongly. Otherwise you will have a lot of <laughs> Okay. Communication open. So if people are interested, they will they'll hopefully do it. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.